Hello all, I'm Sofia Fandidu, ESR14, and today I'm going to talk to you about sustained user engagement. So this presentation is going to be a little bit different than what we are used to so far. Uh, so far we are doing more technical presentation. Uh, however, so, uh, user engagement is in an interdisciplinary field, so it lies between psychology, behavioral science, computer science, and when it comes to the Internet of Sports domain, also sports science. So today we are going to talk a lot about behavioral science and see some technical aspects as well of user engagement. So what we are going to see today, uh, first of all, we are going to talk about our problem statement. So why is user engagement an issue in the Internet of Sports domain? We are going to talk about the hook model, which is a behavioral, uh, which is a design model for designing habit forming products. Then we are going to see the persuasive systems, systems design framework, uh, which creators can use to create behavior change products. Um, uh, finally, we are going to see how we can evaluate our models and our products by measuring user engagement. And last but not least, uh, we are going to uh, let's say mention a brief note on ethics uh, because in the end user engagement and habit formation is some sort of manipulation even a positive one so creators should be careful when creating habit forming products first of all problem statement so what is the issue with a wearables market and what can be done about it the wearables market is quite big it's estimated that one in five Americans uses a smartwatch or a fitness tracker this year and it is expected that, expected that uh, one in four Americans will be using one by 2022. And of course, these numbers are expected to grow, to grow in the next years as well. However, um, the wearables market has a secret problem, let's say. Um, the abandonment problem. So many users buy their wearables and within, uh, within a short time frame they abandon them. The reported attrition rates uh, vary significantly between papers and company reports uh, but are nevertheless high, uh, starting from 30% and reaching up to 70% in some cases. And as you can imagine, this is really, really bad uh, for business because uh, customer churn, churn means you are losing your cost customers, so you are losing money. So uh, which are the reasons uh, for abandonment according to a large scale user survey? First of all, it's the cost of collecting and integrating data. And when I mention cost, I don't only mention the monetary cost, but also the time cost. Because uh, especially in applications like food logging uh, or some sort of uh, in, uh, more or less, less common activities uh, like skiing, for instance, um, the typical wearables, that, uh, wearables on the market do not automatically detect activities or food consumption. In that sense, that you require time for manual logging. Uh, also, uh, integrating is a big cost because you might have a Xiaomi phone uh, or a Huawei scale and a Samsung watch um, and there is a time cost when it comes to integrating all these devices and the data coming from all these devices uh, to one platform for, your, for the best understanding. Then there is the cost of having or sharing the data and this refers to the privacy concerns of users. Um, luckily, in the RISE consortium, as you already know, we have some people working on that. Hopefully, we'll improve in this domain. Next, there is the discomfort with information revealed. Uh, so, if you're a high performer, then it's all okay. But imagine you're a very low performer and then you buy a new wearable and uh, it tells you that you are among the bottom 10% of your age group when it comes to physical activity. That creates some discomfort to the user. And this is a reason for some users to abandon their wearables. Then there are the data quality concerns. Uh, as years pass, uh, wearables become more and more accurate. However, many users report that they do not trust the accuracy of the data received from wearable devices still. And thus, they abandon the, their devices. Uh, also, there, is the, there are the users who've already learned enough from their wearables and they feel that they do not longer, do not longer need them. Uh, this means that the users have been using the wearable devices or other forms of uh, fitness tracking for many years or a prolonged period of time 
and now they they feel confident in their own skills um, and their own competence, and that's why they abandon wearable devices. And finally, and this is quite important, life circumstances change. Uh, you might move to a new city and you don't know the jogging routes around. Uh, or you might have a health issue like a broken leg or hand. Or you might have a, a pregnancy or some sort of uh, busy schedule, let's say, from your work. And your wearables do not adjust to your everyday life. Essentially, it's one size fits all. So many users report that uh, change in life circumstances led them to abandon their wearable devices. Now we see that there is a variety of reasons uh, that users abandon their devices. But what could be the solution for solving such a varied problem? Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to say that creating habit-forming uh, wearables uh, is one way to increase user engagement. We are going to talk about habit formation a bit later, uh, but this is actually uh, John's topic for the presentation after summer. Uh, more, uh, moreover, uh, we have to bring value to the users by enhancing the user experience, and that can, that is, that can be done by utilizing frameworks um, that are designed to increase, to enhance the user experience, like the persuasive systems design framework that we're going to talk about later. And with a combination of hub information and enhancing the user experience, you can achieve sustained user engagement. Um, what is user engagement and how we can measure it? We, we will see in the third part of this presentation um, that refers to the research of Yahoo Labs and Munia Lalmas. First of all, starting with the hook model. The hook model is presented in a best-selling book by Nir Eyal. And it talks about creating habit-forming products. And in our case, we can see how this can adapt to the iOS industry and specifically creating habit-forming wearables. The hook model um, consists of four phases, the trigger phase, the action phase, the variable reward phase, and the investment phase. If you see, uh, it's designed as a hook, and this means it kind of tries to hook the user to the product and the hook repeats itself after one iteration. So a final investment will, uh, one investment will lead to the next trigger and so on and so forth. Uh, we are going to go through each phase of the model one by one so that we truly understand what the hook model is about. First of all, the trigger phase. What is a trigger? A trigger is a cue, that they, a cue to the user that they need to use your product. The triggers can take two forms. There can be external triggers or internal triggers. External triggers refer to emails, notifications, online ads, and the concept behind them is that external triggers uh, provide the information for what to do next within the trigger. For example, let's say you have a smartwatch. And this smartwatch notifies you for prolonged periods of sedentariness. So if you work a lot and you sit a lot and you don't stand up to do some sort of stretching. So I'm wearing this uh, wearable and after one hour of sitting, it gives me a um, notification, an optic notification and sound notification that I need to do a stretch. Essentially, this is an external trigger, a notification that tells me explicitly what I have to do next, stretch. However, the more powerful triggers are the internal triggers. Internal triggers are um, associations in the user's memory uh, between, let's say, an emotion and an action that follows this emotion. Uh, for example, uh, internal triggers can be emotions, can be routines or situations. The interesting thing is about in internal triggers is that the information about what to do next, uh, next is not explicitly mentioned in the trigger, but it is formed through an association in the user's memory. In, to make it more simple and understandable, uh, let's say that you have a habit of going out to run uh, weekly. And then after every run, uh, you are conditioned, if I may say, to check your wearable for performance information. So how fast did I run? How well did I run? Your wearable does not necessarily notify you and say, oh, you need to check your performance, you know, especially during running. Um, except if it's a knee coaching thing, uh, like what the guys are doing on race folks, but that's a different story. Let's say a traditional uh, wearable does not really notify you that, oh, check me, you know. Uh, however, uh, you have an internal trigger in your mind with a that the situation of running 
will uh, lead to you checking for feedback in your wearable. And that is quite important because this means that it's a habitual thing. It's, it has a habitual nature, let's say. And this means that you do this without even realizing that you're doing it sometimes. So as you can imagine, internal triggers are more power, powerful than external triggers. And what's more, negative emotions are normally powerful uh, internal triggers. And what do I mean by negative emotions? For example, when you are bored, you might check cat videos in YouTube. Or when you are lonely, you might open Facebook to see what the world is doing. And if you are depressed, research says that you use your email client more uh, for checking your mails. So the question is, which are the internal triggers that are driving wearable users? Is it the guilt of non-exercise um, or the fear uh, for health, let's say, consequences of non-exercise? We are not going to talk about this in depth, uh, but one really great way to learn about the internal, tri internal triggers of your customers is by checking the five whys technique. The five whys technique was developed in the Toyota in, by the Toyota Industries. And essentially it says that by asking five times why, uh, you can realize the uh, reason, let's say the deep reason behind the user's behavior. So let's say my user is checking his wearable. Why is my user checking his wearable? Because my user wants to take, get feedback on his performance. And why does he want to get feedback for his performance? And by answering these why questions five times, you can maybe come into a realization of your customer's internal triggers. So moving forward to the next uh, phase of the hook model, after the trigger comes uh, an action, a user action. What is an action? An action is the simplest behavior in anticipation of a reward. Most successful products like Facebook and Instagram, for example, um, utilize really simple actions at their core. Facebook utilizes the action of scrolling. You essentially just scroll through a wall, the same for Instagram. Uh, Google utilizes a search. It's just a search button. And YouTube utilizes a play button. Uh, so a very simple action can give you a really powerful experience, like a really interesting experience uh, after, after it, and a reward, if I may say. So for wearables, I'd say that the simplest action you can do is check your wearable. You check your wearable and then you get a feedback on your performance. The interesting thing about this feedback is that it's a surprise. You never know what it's, you're going to see. And that is a very interesting point, the point, the variability of feedback that we're gonna talk about this later. However, there are also more complicated actions like inviting friends to your fitness network or manually logging activities. Uh, of course, the, simple, the simpler an activity is, uh, the most effective it is for the hook model to continue. Uh, because more complicated activities require more motivation and ability from the user to perform the behavior. And how can we quantify this? We can do that by the FOG behavior model. So the FOG behavior model uh, highlights three principal elements uh, that are drivers of the behavior. In other words, it highlights three elements that need to occur together at the same time in order for a behavior, let's say exercise, to occur. This framework uh, has been widely applied in uh, industry since 2003 and has been proven valid in multiple situations. So what the FOG behavior model says, for a behavior to occur, so B, uh, we need three elements coming together at one moment, uh, motivation, and namely the users need to be sufficiently motivated uh, to perform the behavior, let's say of exercise, uh, ability, the users must have the capacity of performing the target behavior, and then the prompt or trigger, There's, there should be an internal or external trigger to, let's say, prompt the users uh, to perform the target behavior. So, for example, let's say we have a wearable device paired with a mobile fitness app that suggests training uh, schedules for the user. In order for this app to, success, uh, to succeed and engage its users, uh, it needs to have, um, the users need to have a specific uh, level of motivation, a medium or high level of motivation. Why? Because physical exercise is not an easy to do task. It requires some sort, some sort of physical effort. So I would say that it lies somewhere in between the middle and the, the end of the ability axis. 
Uh, that means that for a prompt to prompt to be successful, to pass the green action line, the user needs to be sufficiently motivated to exercise. Otherwise, whatever prompt you use, whatever reminder you use, uh, it will fail. It will fall behind the, below the green line that you see in the image. Um, the interesting thing here is that there is an order that you can try and change uh, these core elements, let's say, of user's behavior. The easiest element to change is the prompt. Um, first, you, may, you have to make sure that there is the right prompt for the target behavior. Uh, then you can try uh, to increase the ability of the user to perform the, right, the target behavior. So make the behavior easier to do in some way. For example, suggest step-by-step -step exercise guides to the user. And the last thing you can try to increase is motivation because motivation is pretty hard to increase actually. So first you have to try to increase prompt and ability and then the last resort should be to try to increase motivation of the user. Um, because it's quite hard to persuade users to do things that they don't already want to do. So, uh, which are the core motivators that lead us to adopt certain behaviors? Uh, all humans have six core motivators. Uh, humans tend to seek pleasure and avoid pain. They tend to seek hope and avoid fear. And they tend to seek social acceptance and avoid social rejection. Now, you may notice that the fitness industry and the iOS industry might class a little bit with the pleasure versus pain core motivator because physical activity does uh, lead to some physical extortion, some pain, if I may say. So this means that the motivation of the user might be lower than expected because it does not, let's say, necessarily lead to pleasure for the average user, but it also might lead to physical extortion. And that is why uh, in the iOS domain, we need to pay lots of attention to the um, uh, increasing the ability of the user of performing a certain behavior, of performing the target behavior. And there are six ways you can increase the ability of the user, increase or decrease negatively. Um, uh, the influence factors of behavior, of ability, include time, money, physical effort, brain cycles, social deviance and routine. For example, if we want to increase the ability of the user to perform exercise through uh, wearables or fitness apps, we might want to make it uh, less time consuming. For example, uh, if you suggest to the user to do 30 minutes of moderate, moderate to, phys uh, to vigorous physical activity every day, then the user has to spend time to think how they're gonna do it and where they're gonna do it. Will they go to the gym? Will they do it out in a park? Uh, will they do jogging? Will they do yoga? So it's a pretty time consuming task to figure out a schedule. Uh, however, if uh, your wearable device paired with a mobile app suggests a uh, place and the time and uh, exercise, step-by-step -step exercise schedule for the user, this means that we make the behavior easier and we make the user more able to do it. We increase the ability of the user to perform this behavior. Um, similarly, when it comes to routine, we are all very busy with our schedules and sometimes we feel that exercise does not really fit in. Uh, so what a wearable device and the creator of a wearable device can do um, to increase the ability of the user to fit exercise in their schedule is maybe integrating the calendar of the user and exercise together in the fitness app uh, or also they can uh, try to incorporate, let's say, uh, exercise into the user's daily life. For example, by uh, promoting active transport or active breaks at work. So essentially technological solutions should focus on increasing the user's ability rather than motivation through increasing these six, increasing, let's say, the um, effect of these influence factors. Next phase of the hook is the variable reward. So after the action, uh, we need to give user a reward for the action because remember the definition, an action is the simplest behavior in anticipation of a reward. So this is essentially is based on how our brains function. Um, anticipation of a reward essentially stimulates the stress of desire. Uh, when we are waiting our, uh, for a reward, our reward system activates with anticipation. And when we get our reward, uh, our reward system, system calms down when we get it. Essentially, an, an app or a wearable 
should reward their users by scratching these eats, scratching, let's say, the reward system in our brains. Um, however, here is a catch. Um, if uh, the rewards that are provided are um, every day the same, kind of, or every time the same, then uh, it's, not, it's not as rewarding for our brain anymore. Uh, let's say if you get a badge in the end of the day for achieving your 10,000 step goal and every day it's the same, that does not really uh, supercharge, if I may say, our reward system. What supercharges our reward system is variability. Uh, variability and the unknown increases the stress of desire and thus increase the target behavior. So take Facebook, for example, or Instagram. Uh, when we are doing a simple action like scrolling, the moment we move our finger, we have an immediate variable reward because uh, we are getting uh, new posts or new tweets of unknown content. So we get an abundance of information, of unknown previously information with the scroll of a finger. And every time uh, we scroll, we get new information. So they give us um, con constantly variable rewards. What uh, form can these variable rewards take? Uh, we have three types of rewards. Um, the rewards of the tribe, the rewards of the hunt, and the rewards of the self. Let me make it more explainable. Um, the rewards of the tribe are essentially social rewards. Uh, humans are social beings, and the search, the search for social rewards is fueled by our connectedness with other people. It's no wonder that the use of social media has exploded over the past uh, years. Um, Facebook and Twitter, to name a few, they are some of the most powerful players when it comes to tribe rewards. Uh, when I post something on Instagram or on Facebook, I'm constantly wait, uh, waiting for the variable reward of the validation of other people, of their reactions, their likes, their comments. At the same time, as sociable as we are, uh, our individual need for sustenance is even more crucial. And there goes the rewards of the hand. In the past, people you uh, handed for food and other resources for physical things. Uh, but now that this, let's say, domain is covered, we are handing for information and for deals. And these are the rewards of the hand. Um, Twitter takes advantage of this reward by providing, let's say, users with uh, the, an endless stream of the variable reward of the hand. Uh, it gives us an endless stream of information. Finally, there are rewards of the self. Uh, that they refer to the personal gratification, uh, the search for intrinsic rewards like mastery, competence, and completion. In the uh, Internet of Sports domain, that might be um, levels of completion or some sort of goal accomplishment uh, reward system, etc., etc. And to create habit forming products, we need to use one or more types of variable rewards. Finally, uh, after providing a reward to the user, we expect something back. Uh, we accept, expect an investment uh, from the user. An investment is uh, different from um, an action because an action is, uh, anticipates an immediate reward. An investment, however, is something the user does uh, for future benefits. And an investment uh, can be in the form of a social capital, time, money, data, effort, or emotional commitment. And for example, uh, let's say on, um, we spend our time on social media or uh, we spend our social capital on social media, we create circles. And um, the more circles we create, uh, the more people we add, the more followers we have, uh, the bigger in the investment it is. And why is an investment important for the user? Uh, as you remember, the investment is the last part of the hook, but the hook is supposed to be iterative. It's supposed to happen all the time. Everybody, every time the user logs in into our application, it's supposed, like a single session is supposed, let's say, to be a single hook. So an investment by the user can load the next, uh, the next hook, uh, the next external trigger, for example. For instance, um, in the wearables domain, uh, a personal goal setting investment. So you go manually and you change your you change your goals. There is this system, let's say, in the wearable, um, can lead the next external trigger. So with the completion of your uh, goal, your step goal, uh, you can get first a notification of goal accomplishment, and potentially you can get an external trigger for investing more, for adapting your goal. 
So let's say you had a 10,000 steps goal, you achieve it, then the system uh, loads the next external trigger based on this investment and tells you, okay, Sophia, um, you managed to do 10,000 steps, congratulations. How about you uh, create a new step goal? And this is a new investment in the part of the user. Uh, however, there is another very important reason that investments are uh, significant for our system, and that is uh, they store value and they improve the product with use. They store value in terms of content, data, followers, and reputation. So the more you invest in a product, the more difficult it is to go uh, elsewhere. Let's say if I have uh, all my data in Fitbit, and there is no way I can, let's say, um, migrate from Fitbit to Apple Watch or to Samsung Watch, uh, then it will be a pretty uh, big loss for me to lose my two or three or four years of tracking data. And that might lead me to, let's say, invest more in the product rather than abandon, abandoning it. Uh, how um, So, the FOX model that we talked later, as well as the HOOK model, uh, provide the design principles and constitute very, concept, uh, very utilized, conceptualized models of persuasive technology. However, the weaknesses of these models um, are that they do not really explain to designers which features exactly they could utilize um, and which functionalities they could utilize to make their products more persuasive and also to lead to positive behavior change. And there is where the persuasive, persuasive systems design comes, which is a framework for behavior change, if I may say. So uh, persuasive systems design is a framework uh, for system design developed in 2009 uh, by academics. Uh, and it's listing 28 design principles, features, functionalities, if you may want, if, you, if I may say, for persuasive system content and functionality. The PSD framework uh, consists of four uh, parts. The primary task support, so how can you support your users performing their target behavior? The primary task. Uh, the dialogue support, uh, which is a support in the communication between the user and the system. The system credibility support, uh, which includes elements like verifiability, third-party endorsements, trust, expertise, etc., etc., and finally the social support, um, which includes all social features that the system might have. We are going to go through these categories one by one, and we'll see, let's say, the subcategories uh, that belong to them, and some examples from the iOS domain. So primary task support. So how can you help your users? How can you make it easier for them to perform their target behavior? First, uh, reduction. You have to reduce a complex behavior into simple tasks. For instance, uh, if you recommend a 30 minute training to someone, they have to pay, they, um, they have, let's say, to put too much thought and energy into thinking how they can exercise for 30 minutes. But if you provide a 30 minute step-by-step -step exercise guide for them, then this makes it way simpler for them to exercise. Tunneling. Um, tunneling essentially refers to a system guiding the users through a process and persuading them along the way. So uh, take, a, take into consideration, let's say, a fitness app that first provides, um, asks the users for their fitness goals, uh, short term and long term. And then, based on the user's fitness goal, um, they provide the necessary exercise schedules. So it's a two-step process, and it could be a multiple-step process, uh, process, of course. Tailoring. Uh, tailoring is when a system provides information tailor tailored to different user groups. Essentially, what, he, uh, what this uh, subcategory tells us is that you cannot provide the same content for, let's say, elderly people and kids. Uh, or um, different ethnic groups maybe, or uh, different uh, fitness levels. So essentially you should tailor your product to the user group you are referring to. Then comes personalization, which is a more intense form of tailoring, I would say, uh, which um, refers to the system offering personalized content to and services to their users. Um, in other words, for instance, um, let's say we have a system that adapts the user goals based on the user's past performance, uh, based on the weather conditions, the user schedule, etc., etc. So it's a very personalized experience. Then we have self-monitoring. This is kind of a given in the iOS domain um, because, I mean, um, it refers to providing a means 
to the user for tracking their behavior. And this is by default in the iOS domain. And then we have simulation. Uh, users, uh, systems should provide the means to observe the link between cause and effect. Uh, in other words, uh, let's say we have a fitness app that provides visualizations about active hours within the day. So which hours within a day you were active and which you were inactive. This way you can connect uh, certain, scale, certain times and certain locations. Uh, so the cause with activity or inactivity, so the result. Um, and finally, we have rehearsal. Uh, the system should provide means to the user for rehearsing the target behavior. Uh, let's say we have a system uh, with step-by-step -step, uh, guides of exercise. It's, uh, there, should be, there should be potentially a demonstration video or a demonstration icon to show to the user how it can be done and help the user up, up, uh, along the way of rehearsing the behavior. Then we have the dialogue support. Uh, I remind you here that this is the communication between the system and the user. It includes praise, so let's say con congratulating the user on um, achieving their 10,000 step goal. It includes rewards, um, which could be providing virtual rewards to users like badges or points for performing the target behavior. Um, then we have reminders. Um, for example, um, your smartwatch reminding you that you are sedentary for a very long time and you need to stretch. We have suggestions. Uh, the system su suggests that the users carry out certain behaviors like uh, exercise and training schedules. Uh, or, for example, what race folks have. Um, the system should provide suggestions on how to perform a specific behavior in a more advanced way. Then we have similarity. The system should remind users of themselves. Uh, for example, if you have um, a system that is, uh, let's say, designed for kids, maybe you should have kids demonstrating the exercises or kid figures or animation characters, something that really imitate, uh, imitates users in some way and they remind them of themselves, reminds them of themselves. Then we have liking. The system should be visually attractive. Nowadays, what visually attractive means could be, let's say, minimal design, but this changes according to the aesthetics its uh, creator wants to achieve. And then we have the social role. Um, the system should adopt a social role. Let's say the system should be your trainer, or it should be some systems utilize virtual pets or virtual plants that, let's say, get better or get care through the user's exercising. Then we have system credibility category, and this refers to everything that, let's say, is more about technical details of the system. Um, it refers to trustworthiness. The system uh, should provide trustworthy information, so let's say accurate step counts, uh, expertise. Uh, the system should uh, show knowledge and exp experience in the specific domain. For example, a training fitness app or a wearable should be designed uh, along with um, certified trainers. Surface credibility, the system should have a competent uh, look and feel. Uh, that means there should be a limited, let's say, number of ads, and because a system with multiple and irrelevant ads does not really lead to persuasion for the user. Uh, it's counterproductive. It should have a real world feel. So there should be means to contact and know who the person or the organization behind the system is, some sort of contact form, some sort of newsletter informing you about the creator, from the creators informing you about the creators and the users, etc. Then we have authority. The system should refer to people of, in, uh, of authority. Uh, for instance, uh, Google, let's say, fitness app, uh, they utilize the World Health, Health Organization and they say they set, let's say, the user's goal uh, based on the recommendations from uh, the World Health Organization. Then third-party endorsements. Um, your system should clearly so third-party endorsements, potentially, for example, for accessible design or endor endorsements from health organizations, etc. And finally, for this category, verifiability, the system should provide means to verify the accuracy of the content. Um, so whenever we cite someone else, let's say, give the proper citation in the system. And finally, last but not least, this is quite important, especially in the social media era, is social support. The system should include social features. 
And this includes social learning. This, um, it, the system should provide a way for you to observe others' behaviors, um, whether this is by public, fit, public fitness profile in Fitbit or with discussion forums with users for similar goals. Uh, then there comes uh, social comparison, which is pretty similar, but in the opposite direction. Um, the system should provide a mean for you to compare yourself uh, to others. For example, let's say you have a fitness app or a wearable that allows you to connect with friends and compare your step goal performance with their step goal performance. Then we have normative influence. You have to make the users feel the norm. So how, um, how they stand, let's say, compared to the average user. And that many wearables do. If you see that they have some sort of histogram and they tell you, okay, you are in the top 10 most perform, most performant, most active users. Um, then we have social facilitation. Uh, the system should provide means to discern users performing the, the behavior along with you. So let's say we have uh, competition and competitions and walking challenges and the system should tell you, let's say 100 users, one, uh, 100 more users are taking this challenge along with you. It shows that you are not alone in this kind of. Then we have cooperation. The system should provide means for cooperation. Uh, for example, uh, wearable devices that allow for collective goal setting. So me and Stefanos, for instance, could set like, a walking goal together and then we work together towards the achieve achievement of this goal. Then we have competition. The system should provide means for competing with other users, for example, walking challenges. And finally, uh, we have recognition. And the system should provide public recognition uh, to users who perform the target behavior. For instance, uh, in competitions, there are leaderboards. Uh, you get, um, in some newsletters, you might get the most active users of the month, for instance, in some wearable apps, etc. So, uh, we've talked about how we can theoretically design a habit forming product, which practical features we could potentially implement, but we never said about how can we evaluate uh, that what we build is actually working. And that is why measuring user engagement is important and where it comes in. Uh, where, where it comes in. Um, the question is, is it really working? What we build is it really working? So essentially user engagement is a quality of the user experience. It's not the user experience per se, it's just a component of the user experience that emphasizes in the phenomena associating with wanting to use a product for longer and more frequently. How, um, the ways we can measure user engagement is through self-reports, for example, uh, surveys, emotion surveys, which measure the emotional aspect of user engagement. Uh, it could be also measured through the physiology of the user, like the gaze of the user, the movement, the physical movement of the user, and this refers to the cognitive aspect, so what your body does uh, of user engagement. And finally, it could be measured through analytics, like user, user, uh, user action logs. And this is the behavioral aspect of user engagement, so how the user behaves. And so why is it important to measure it? Uh, user engagement gives you insights about how your uh, users use your products and how successful the user journey is. Uh, there, there, they, there might be the case that your product brings a lot of value to the user in the beginning, but then this value fails to engage the user uh, along with it um, as the time passes. And that's the purple line, let's say, in the chart that you see. But the product has an initial value, but this value does not go on further. Then there is, let's say, there are products who have no upfront value. And if you have no upfront value and you can measure that, you have to change something in your system fast. And finally, there are the products, uh, which is the ideal case, that have gradual engagement. So the users get engaged more and more because also of the investment they have put into the product in other followers, content, data, etc. Um, moreover, the user, user engagement is a complex contra, uh, con construct. Sorry. Uh, as I've said before, it uh, includes an emotional and cognitive and a behavioral aspect. So there needs to be a standardization of what user engagement is and how we can measure it and in order to benefit research, uh, designers and users alike. So you, uh, there are different attributes to user engagement. Um, there are four, four main categories, scale, setting, objectivity and temporality. 
So there, there is small scale user engagement and large scale user engagement measurements. Small scale could be, let's say, um, eye tracking lab experiment and the large scale could be analyzing the logs of Fitbit users. Uh, then there is the setting of measurement. It could be the lab or it could be a field or in the wild study. Uh, this means that it could, you could call 10 users in the lab and you can tell them that, um, yeah, we'll track your behavior for one hour. Or it could be that uh, you track uh, users uh, who use their wearables in their everyday lives. And this is like a field experiment or in the wild uh, that Stefanos also talked about in the previous presentation. Then we have objecti objectivity. We have objective and subjective measures. Subjective measures include self-reports, so what the users report of themselves, uh, like emotional states or motivational stages. And then we have objective measures, like behavior logs. And finally, we have temporality. Uh, we have sort. We can talk about short-term engagement measurement or long-term engagement measurement. So in short term, it could be just, again, a lab experiment that you perform once uh, and then you, because you want to see, let's say, if version A works better than version B. But long-term engagement might need, uh, might require you to study the users over time, either with multiple lab experiments or let's say with analyzing log, uh, log data behaviors. And uh, I want to note, it, note here that one category, one attribute is not better than the other. It really depends on your aims and constraints and what uh, are the resources available. So it's not necessarily that field ex experiments are better than lab experiments because your aim might only be possible, let's say, in a lab uh, setting. Uh, I, so which are the measures we can utilize to measure user engagement? When it comes to self-report uh, measures, we can utilize it. Uh, questionnaires, interviews, think aloud or think after protocols, which is essentially you um, take a user and you put, let's say, a technological product in front of him, and you ask him either to comment while he's using it or to comment after he's using it. Um, this, um, this, let's say, uh, this approach is uh, subjective because it really depends on what the user reports. Uh, it could be short term or long term um, in a sense that you can call the users, uh, you can send a questionnaire to the users once uh, or you can send multiple questionnaires over time to the user um, to study the user engagement over time. It could be lab, uh, the setting could be either in the lab or in the wild. Uh, you can give, normally it's in the um, in a lab setting, let's say, you can give questionnaires to the user, but you can also give uh, some sort of um, momentary assessments to the user in the wild uh, in the wild for example when you are on google maps and you get like um, rate your experience uh, rate your driving experience uh, with stars that's also like a self-report and it's in the field in the wild uh, and then they are normally small scale because i mean how many questionnaires can you send maybe thousands or a few thousands but it's not necessarily it's normally not large scale uh, then we have uh, the physiology approach, so studying the body of the user and how it reacts. Uh, you can do so by electrocardiograms, SCLs, um, F, uh, which is like a skin conductance level of the user, uh, MRIs, eye tracking, and mouse tracking. Uh, they are objective measures, um, of course, because you measure the, how the body of the user reacts. Uh, they are short term in a sense you call the user once, let's say you put them in an F MRI machine and then you check how their brain reacts to the technological program. Um, they can be in the, they mostly are in the lab, but it can they can also be in the field, especially when it comes to mouse tracking. Uh, so the mouse tracking can be done in the wild research as well. And then they can be small and large scale. Uh, mostly they are small scale, but again, when it comes to mouse tracking, uh, it can be a large scale experiment. Finally, we have analytics, uh, which is closely related to us, uh, which the measures can be intra and inter session, uh, which means that uh, you calculate measures within the one user session or within multiple user sessions, um, which refers to and generally data analytics, um, log analytics, etc. Uh, these are objective measures. They, could, they can be short-term or long-term, depending on the time span you're looking at. Uh, they are normally in the wild, and they are typically large-scale. 
let's go a little bit deeper on this category because it's the most interesting for us. Um, I will focus on the single site measures. Um, for example, in intra-session measures, we have session duration, also known as, a, as dual time. We have the click-through rates, mouse movements, the click depth, etc. And intersession measures, so measures between two different sessions, uh, like the fraction of return visits, uh, the intersession rate, uh, sessions per, use, per unit of time, etc. What I want to I want you to notice here is that first of all, there is no standardization of user engagement. There is not some sort of framework that says you should measure one, ten things and then you're good. It really depends on your use case um, and what you, what your goal, what you want to achieve. Uh, however, what I want to, let's say, point out is that there is no standardized frame framework or there are no standardized metrics for user engagement on wearable devices. You cannot really measure the, let's say, conversion rate maybe of uh, wearable user devices, but you could measure potentially the, um, the, depth, the click depth, so how many pages a user views, but it's not really pages, it's more like the watch faces. So there is, not some, there is no some sort of standardized measuring of user engagement for wearable devices, and that's definitely an interesting field uh, for research. And now, before closing, um, I want to make a, a brief note on ethics. So uh, we are talking about habit formation, behavior change, and all this might sound a little bit like manipulation. And habit formation is indeed some sort of form of manipulation. And what I want to present here as a, let's say, self-check, if, if I may say, is the manipulation matrix. It's also called the drug dealer's matrix. <laughs> um, so uh, that's actually taken from the book. And, uh, what um, from the hooked book that we discussed earlier, um, and what let's say a drug, the rule of the number one rule of a drug dealer is that you should never use your own product. However, if you want to be ethical in creating habit forming products, you should do the exact opposite. You should be the user of your product. Uh, you should want to use your product. Um, and that means that you, let's say you are a facilitator because the maker uses it, you use it, uh, and it also, let's say, materially improves the user's life. So you want to be a, a facilitator, you want to help people find meaning through your products, you want to help them engage in behaviors they are positive for them, that are positive for them and that they want to engage with. Because let's admit it that users nowadays can um, reach levels of addictions with technological products, they take them to bed, um, we take them to bed, uh, we use them maybe before saying good morning to our partner um, and let's say uh, uh, be, they can be pretty addictive. So as creators we should make sure um, that we're creating products that, are, that uh, significantly improve the quality of life of our users. Finally some key takeaway, uh, the key takeaways uh, to close up. More features does not necessarily mean a better pro uh, product, and it does not necessarily uh, correct the attrition problem. What corrects the attrition problem is creating engaging and habit-forming products. Uh, the hook model can help us create habit-forming products, and the persuasive systems design fra framework can help developers in building functionality uh, for positive behavior change. Moreover, uh, after building our product, we should always measure user engagement for quantifying the user journey. And keep in mind that we should build products that bring positive change to users' lives uh, to be on the ethical side of, of things. Thank you for your attention and I'm open for questions now. Thank you very much for the very, very interesting presentation, Sofia. So, Thank you. are there any questions? Uh, uh, yes, Mangus, tell me. Uh, uh, no, uh, I was um, uploading first, but yeah. Uh, okay. thank you, <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, like, um, thank you for like a very different um, domain because uh, that's that's very, open-minding for me. I never thought it like that way about like products, 
but um, uh, I had a question more like uh, from like the, the GDPR perspective. Is mm -hmm. this something that can be used for like, uh, as you said, I mean, can be easily used for like uh, seducing like gamers or that have big problems with like with addiction? And then uh, is it going to be like very, uh, I mean, the GDPR or other things that come from the European Union, are they going to be like very big fans for this kind of research? Okay, so um, I'm gonna answer the question in two parts. Um, firstly, creating habit-forming products and very engaging products can indeed be, let's say, a little bit of a trap. So uh, if, you're, uh, if you're using, utilizing the hook model, let's say, for creating uh, products that do not really bring immediate benefit to, the, to your user, like, um, for example, uh, when it comes to gaming, as you mentioned, uh, which is entertaining, yes, but it does not bring a substantial change in user's life, uh, then maybe you are not so much in the ethical corner of the facilitator. Let me go back on the ethics slide. Uh, okay, I'm not sure I am, okay. So, uh, essentially, you are, if you, especially, you might even be in the dealer slide because you, the maker might potentially does not use the game for themselves and also it does not improve the user's life substantially. And if you're not a dealer, you're an entertainer. Um, so you lie, let's say, on the bottom of the manipulation matrix uh, when it comes to ethics. However, if you talk about the fitness uh, apps and wearables and the, and the use of the hook model for promoting healthy exercise, uh, for promoting healthy behavior change like exercise, then you're potentially in the facilitator uh, box. So you could potentially use your own product um, or, and it materially improves the user's life. So of course, one technology or one model and framework can use for multiple pur purposes, might that be uh, bad or good, um, but we should, we should separate, let's say, the good from the bad. So helping users achieve what they already want to achieve, uh, main, namely, having healthier lives and more active lives um, is indeed a form of positive manipulation, if I may say. I wouldn't even use the word manipulation in this case. I, I would use the word, let's say, positive influence. Uh, when it comes to GDPR, um, of, like, of course, there should be a balance between the level of personalization or integration and the level of uh, privacy. Uh, with privacy, as we've seen already, is uh, one concern of the users and it leads to abandonment anyway. Um, so, uh, thankfully, in the RISE Consortium, we have people who are working on the privacy domain. I assume they are also looking into the GDPR and anonymization practices. And it would be extremely interesting, uh, I believe, to design a framework for quantifying or measuring user engagement, taking into account GDPR and other privacy legislation, let's say, the one that they have, uh, Privacy Act, I think, they have in California. Um, that would be also an extremely interesting uh, field to study, standardizing, let's say, user engagement measurement for wearables, and at the same time, respecting the user's privacy. But of course, it's a very thin line and it's really easy to cross the line. Uh, I will not say otherwise, uh, but um, let's say the focus uh, within the consortium and within the people who are building health change program, prob uh, programs uh, should be to engage users in something important, in improving their health. I, I hope this covers your question and I'd be happy to answer in more depth maybe. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm just worried that if this uh, will become like a standard in the market and there will be more and more regulation to regulate how this uh, personalized um, uh, signal is coming from the body because that's how, how you, you direct your, uh, your um, manipulation. I mean... Uh, yes, essentially the books um, is not really the book, the, hooked mo uh, the hook model book, uh, that's, let's say, mostly the one, the one that refers to manipulation, um, is not really a new framework. Uh, the guy behind it, near AL, um, he has been studying, working in big companies uh, for years, and then he decided to write down, let's say, the techniques that big companies use, uh, maybe for the wrong purposes sometimes, um, for other product designers, who might want to use it for good purposes, or at least that's, um, that's what is mentioned in the book. 
So it's not something new, really. It's something that's been used for years and in the wrong domains, maybe. And now it's being made accessible in the right domains, if I may say. Uh, iOS being one of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but um, it's good. I mean, I think this uh, deserves a lot more uh, research than than is publicly known because, I mean, people... I, I think, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but I think this is more important than it yeah, is. Yeah, I definitely agree. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Any more questions? I'll be glad to take. Okay, I think Lodovico, we might not have more questions. Okay, then uh, if that's all, I would like to say thank you again to Sofia for our very, very interesting presentation and also thank you to everybody for uh, attending this meeting. And uh, so uh, now we will have a summer break for the seminars until, uh, I believe, September 3rd or anyway, somewhere around the beginning of September when we will start with the last um, with the second part of the year, and so we'll have, uh, I believe, uh, six more uh, seminars for uh, 2020 until December, yeah. So, thank you everyone for attending, uh, and for the seminars, uh, see you back uh, after the summer holidays. Thank you, Sophia.